white blood cells, hemocytoblasts again, right? The stem cells. So if we take a look, there's that hemocytoblast again that made the red cells, but it's also responsible for making the precursors for the white blood cells. Right? So the, the white blood cells are going to originate in the bone marrow. Uh, it turns out that some of the white blood cells, uh, the lymphocytes, actually have some of their precursor cells that travel to lymphoid tissues, like the thymus, uh, like the spleen, uh, and, and lymph nodes, uh, and can produce uh, white blood cells in, in those tissues. But all of them start out in the, in the bone marrow. Relatively short life cycle, because these are due to body defense, or are used in body defense, although some of the white blood cells we'll find when we talk about the immune system may live for years. Right? They can live for, for years in the body. So let's look first at the granulocytes. Okay? The granulocytes. Those white blood cells that have granules, and it turns out there are three different types of granulocytes. Look from real quickly here. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. Okay? We're going to go through each of those three types. They have granules that we can see when we stain them with a particular stain called Wright's stain, like the Wright brothers. Um, those of you that have lab, on Monday, you'll be staining your blood with Wright's stain so that you can see the different types of, of white blood cells in, in your, uh, your blood. But let's start with the neutrophils. Phil means to like. They like the neutral pink stain. Huh? So these granulocytes like the neutral pink stain. And so they're going to have pink granules. And when we look at their nucleus, the nucleus has two to five segments. So it might look like this cell has four different nuclei. It doesn't. If you look closely, you can see that we can see partly anyway where the nuclei portions of the nucleus uh, are joined. So it's a single nucleus, but in two to five uh, segments. The neutrophils are phagocytes. Okay? That's their job. They're phagocytes. They're eaters, right? So when you are invaded by bacteria, the neutrophils will be attracted to those uh, invaders and eat them. Uh, when the invaders get into your body and start causing tissue damage, chemicals are going to be released that we call leukotoxins. If you take a taxi, what did you do? You went somewhere, right? You moved. So leukotoxins cause movement of white blood cells. They attract the white blood cells. The neutrophils are going to move by amoeboid movement. Okay? Amoeboid movement. So I'm hoping somewhere in your grade school or high school, uh, a science teacher sat you down in front of a microscope and let you watch an amoeba move. How many of you got to see this? Oh boy. That's too bad. It's really pretty neat to see, folks. You probably could go on YouTube and, and uh, Google this. So an amoeba moves by putting out an extension of its cytoplasm, and then it follows it, right? So it kind of squishes itself out and then follows it. So your neutrophils leave your blood by squeezing through the pores of a capillary and go out into the tissues and start to move through your tissues, being attracted to these chemicals that are being released when an invader has, has come in. So they're, they're crawling around everywhere in your body right now, right, trying to help uh, protect you. What uh, pretty good phagocytes, typically eat about 25 bacteria before they end up dying. And what chemicals is it that they're being um, uh, A group of chemicals that we call leukotaxins. And we're, when we get to the immune system, we'll look more at what those leukotaxins are. So the phagocytes are making those, and, uh, and so this knows about that. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense to me. Eosinophils. Eosin is a red stain. So these are the 
the white blood cells, the granulocytes that like the red stain. And so they're going to have red staining granules. You can see them here. Uh, and typically a bilobed nucleus, sometimes trilobed. And so this one that they showed here happened to have three lobes to the, the nucleus, but typically bilobed. Those granules in an eosinophil contain antihistamine. Uh, antihistamine. So you know about antihistamines this time of year. They're pretty popular at the pharmacies, right? Because they help you with your allergies, right? They help you with your allergies. Uh, these cells are phagocytes, okay? They're capable of phagocytosis. They also will release their antihistamines to help quiet down inflammation, right? To decrease inflammation. They also tend to increase uh, when you have parasitic infections and that they're going to try to go and eat the, the parasites. And then finally, basophils. The basophils like a blue staining, uh, or like a blue stain, and that blue stain is going to stain their granules, a nice kind of purple blue color. Right? So I know it doesn't look really blue, but they're kind of a purple blue color here. Again, typically a bilobed nucleus. And the basophils contain granules that have histamine and heparin. Okay. Histamine and heparin. So heparin is an anticoagulant, and histamine is involved in inflammation. It's what's, what causes most of the inflammation. They're also phagocytes. But they're mildly phagocytic, so they'll, they'll do some phagocytosis. When basophils move out into your tissues, they become cells that we call mast cells. Okay? When they move out into the tissues, we're going to call them mast cells. We'll find out why when we get to the immune system. All right, so those are the granulocytes. What about the agranulocytes? Right, let's take a look at that A granulocyte. Those that don't have any granules. When you look at the A granulocytes, there are two types: the lymphocytes and the monocytes. Okay? Lymphocytes and monocytes. Let's do lymphocytes first. Mr. Ford, histamine um, decreases inflammation. Uh, increases inflammation. Okay. Increases inflammation. When we get to the immune system, and also in the, cardi the more of the cardiovascular system, we'll talk a little bit more about the functions of histamine. But you know what, right? I mean, you take antihistamines because you have allergies, and so the things that you're experiencing when you have an allergy, what are you getting? You're getting increased fluid loss, increased redness, right? And, and all of that's really changes to the cardiovascular system. We'll, we'll get to it later. So lymphocytes, and monocytes. A lymphocyte, when we look at it, has a nice round nucleus, and the nucleus fills almost the entire cell. So we expect to see just a little bit of cytoplasm, a little crescent moon, typically, of, of cytoplasm. The lymphocytes are the only white blood cells that are not phagocytes, but they have another very important function. The lymphocytes are involved in the production of antibodies. Okay, they're going to make those gamma globulins that work to protect our body. Okay, so they're involved in, in antibody production. And it turns out there are really two different major subgroups of lymphocytes. Some of them are called T cells, and some of them are called B cells. When we get to the immune system, you'll know a lot more about T cells and, and B cells and, and why we have the two different types. So finally here on our white blood cells, we have monocytes. When we look at a monocyte, we find they're the largest of all the white blood cells, so we expect them to be quite large. Look at the size difference between that monocyte and the red cells. And look at, right, compared to a lymphocyte, even compared to the basophils and the eosinophils and the neutrophils. So monocytes are quite large. We typically see a kidney bean shaped nucleus. Not always, but a very commonly a kidney bean shaped nucleus. Lots of cytoplasm. 
And when monocytes leave the blood and move out into the tissues, they become macrophages, the big eaters. Okay? So these killing machines are really, really good at phagocytosis, much better than uh, the neutrophils or eosinophils or, or basophils, macrophages. A differential count. So again, those of you who have lab, on Monday, we're going to stain your blood, and then you're going to count the different types of white blood cells that you have in your blood. And so what we do is we count the first 100 white blood cells that we come to, and if we're counting white blood cells and we count 100, then the number of each will be a percentage of the total number that you have, right? Uh, and so we call this a differential count, in a clinical setting, they never like to say words that have more than one syllable. It takes them too long. So they're not going to say a differential count. They're going to say, let's get a diff. Right? So they'll just say, get a diff. They want a differential count. When you go to the doctor and you're ill, the physician will order a complete blood count. They're going to check your red cell numbers, your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, your white cell numbers, and they're probably going to get a differential count as well, right? showing the difference numbers of, of, of cells. When we do a differential count, uh, we expect to see different proportions of the different white cells. There's actually quite a wide range of numbers for each group, but I'm going to have you learn a telephone number to remember about where the differential should fall. And the, the telephone number that I want you to remember is 6525-631. You can call me anytime. 6525-631. So there's the number, 6525-631. And it turns out that these are kind of middle of the road average numbers that we might expect in a normal individual when we did a differential. In a wide range of normal, right? But pretty much in the middle. And so we expect to find about 65% neutrophils, about 25% lymphocytes, about 6% monocytes, about 3% eosinophils, and about 1% basophils. Now when a doctor orders this differential count and it comes back and there are differences in these numbers, then it will help the diagnose, for the diagnosis of a particular disease. For instance, if we found that the individual had an elevated number of, of neutrophils, we might suspect that they have an acute infection, right? So some bacteria just got into the body and has raised those, those numbers up. If we find elevated lymphocyte numbers, we might expect that they have a viral infection. Individual or uh, increased numbers of, of monocytes tends to indicate chronic infections, right? long-term infections. If the eosinophils are elevated, and many of you maybe right now they are, because we expect that to happen if the person has allergies or perhaps a parasite. And basophils uh, can increase sometimes in uh, chronic infections and in some types of, of leukemias. Okay, so Differential. Some abnormalities of white blood cells. Uh, oh, some terminology here. Right? So if a person has leukocytosis, that would mean an elevated number of white blood cells, uh, and that would be due to uh, an infection, typically. Leukopenia, a decrease in white cell number a decrease in the white cell number. Uh, this can be due to uh, numerous uh, diseases, for instance, something like AIDS that you've heard of, right? Uh, there are certain drugs that can cause uh, leukopenias, white blood cell number. <coughs> and then finally, leukemia, and this is a cancer of the white blood cell producing tissues. Let's take a look at thrombocytes, okay? the thrombocytes, the clotting cells, thromboclotcyte cell. It turns out thrombocytes aren't really cells, okay? they're not really cells. 
there are portions of the magnetarial blast uh, that we'll look at in a second. Uh, another name for a thrombocyte is a platelet. Okay. Another name for a thrombocyte is a platelet. So let's go back to our little chart here. Here was the hemocytoblast, the mother cell, right? the stem cell. Over here on the far right is a cell that's called a megakaryoblast. And that cell actually eventually splits into little tiny portions. So they're still membrane enclosed, but it's no longer a whole cell, right? They're little pieces. And that's what we actually call the thrombocytes or the platelets. Okay. So we're going to have this, this big cell called a megakaryoblast that fragments uh, into these thrombocytes. The thrombocytes are important for starting the clotting process. Okay. They're going to start the, the clotting process. Uh, they can form something that we call a platelet plug so that as you get leaks in blood vessels, the platelets will adhere to those leaks and plug them up. Turns out, folks, you're getting leaks in your blood vessels all the time, particularly in areas where there's lots of friction, elbows, knees, that kind of area. And as you get these little tiny leaks, the platelets are Johnny on the spot. They'll plug up the little leaks so that you don't leak out of that, that uh, hole that, that's formed due to oftentimes uh, friction. This diagram is trying, our, our photo micrograph is trying to show you some platelets. So there's right, platelets next to the red blood cells. 